Welcome to Marketplace and Authority, where we will encourage and help you to walk in your true identity in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is there an area of your life that's out of focus and you're struggling in? We're here to give you tools that will bring you hope and breakthrough. Guests from all over the country will share and bring strategies to you, the viewer, so you can apply them to your life. In turn, you will bring influence and authority in the areas of family, business, education, government, religion, arts, entertainment, and media. Receive your breakthrough and help others to experience their breakthrough. Welcome to Marketplace and Authority. I'll be your host, I'm Dr. Ken Smith. Here's a thought for today. I'm very impressed and excited to have my next guest. It took me a long time to get her. She's an apostolic leader, businesswoman, very, very successful. She's got ministries. I could talk about her. It'd take the whole program to tell you who she is. But I'm just going to get to the point and tell you who she is. This is the Apostle Deborah. Thank you so much for coming on with us today. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Now, I want to get right in and give you an idea of what I know about her. Maybe she can share with us, maybe take two or three minutes, and tell us how you got saved at, at the youth, and then we'll go into your business, uh, uh, how you started your business, and we'll go from there. Please. Okay, I originally was baptized at seven through the bus that used to come to our community. And then from there, as I got older, 14 is when I became very active in church with my family. Oh, that's good. And then 19, when I started hitting the streets, okay. something happened and was like, well, the streets are not for you. So I became really, really active in my church that I joined at the time. Um, called Greater Bethany okay. and that's when I became really active in the choir and that's when I really started understanding who God was who I was in him how the importance it is to serve God and so I would say I really became like knowing that I was saved at about 19 okay that's wonderful uh, and I can't help but ask how did you develop your business uh, savvy if you will my business savvy is because I've always been an aggressive person, even though I don't come, well, no, I probably do come off aggressive, but I'm a very aggressive person and I don't really take no for an answer and I like to take chances. Okay. So I'll take a chance. If something comes to me, I have an idea to do a business, I just try it because I realize I have nothing to lose. Either I make it work or it doesn't work, but if it doesn't, I'll just go on to the next thing. Amen. So <laughs> how did you get, come to, uh, you said something about nursing. Can you take us from there? And then you jumped into the what you do now. Well, yeah, I was raised by my grandparents. Okay. So when I was younger, I really always wanted to really be a real estate agent because I would see the Century Twenty One commercials on TV when I was younger. But my grandparents, we were from the South, Little Rock, Arkansas, and their thing is you get a job, you pay your bills, you buy a house, you have a family, and that's it. Okay. That wasn't good enough for me, but because my grandparents raised me and they wanted uh, me and my twin sister to become nurses, I went to nursing school. So I became a nurse, even though I was a nurse for like 16 years. Oh my goodness, really? Yes, I was a registered nurse for 16 years, and I wasn't super happy. So one day at lunch, I just got in my car, and usually I would go to my lunch um, break and I would read and take a 30 minute nap. But something in my spirit was like, this is it. So I just left the parking lot, the parking structure of the hospital and I never looked back and I decided to go into real estate. Wow, and that's the voice of the Lord. Isn't that interesting, 16 means covenant, interesting. But this job, now think about it, you viewers, this is teaching mode and I want apostle to speak into this. So here you are at your job and this is what COVID has done for all of us. Some realize that's not really the job for them. Can you speak a little bit deeper in that? So you were a great nurse, you had all these accolades, you were always nurse of the month and all these things, but something called you deeper. And then what? for the viewers, what would you recommend for them if they have that call? Well, for one, you have to really be sensitive to your spirit. When I began at 19 to really get deeper in the things of God, I was able to really, at the time, I didn't necessarily know my calling that I have the prophetic, 
I'm a seer. There's a lot of different things, but I knew that I was a dreamer. I knew that I could see things. I knew I would have daydreams. And I knew that my spirit would always say certain things to me, and it usually would happen. Like, literally, it would manifest. So when I heard the, that spirit that said, leave the job, this is it, I left. And when I was driving home, my spirit also said, hey, you know, your child, for your childhood friend, Floyd, just started a mortgage company. Call him up. So I called him up, and I... Um, went to see him the following week. He was like, yeah, come on down. I'm in Cerritos. Come to my office. So I went, I interviewed with him, and that was the first place I started. But while I was working with him, I ran into another friend at the Cheesecake Factory who owned four mortgage companies in four different states. Mm -hmm. And I was telling him how I was doing real estate. He was like, well, how can you do real estate? You know, I'm the guru of real estate, and you didn't come to me. So I said, okay, well, I'll come to you. So I wind up going the following week to meet him at his office in West Covina. But the, the teaching point for this is I was so excited and gung-ho about my spirit telling me to call Floyd the first time. Good work. But Floyd's business was not the type of business of integrity that God wanted me to be a part of. But the, the teaching moment here is I stepped out on faith. So that's the first teaching moment. I stepped out on faith. I had a great job. My nursing job, I was in my 20s. I was making $113,000 a year in my wow. 20s. So who, right? Who does that? Who, who drives does that? that? <laughs> so, I, so I stepped out on faith and I was getting job abandonment letters and everything. Again, uh, moving forward, I called Floyd. I started with him, but I was noticing like these things that his business that made me feel like, mm, this might be a little not integrous and I'm not really learning and it wasn't really what I needed. So then I, um, I ran into Mr. Belser at Global Financial. I wind up going to interview with him. And when I got to his office, he was in the Wells Fargo building. He had the pits and they introduced me to how to cold call. And it was very discouraging at first where I was like, God, mm, I left my job and now, oh my God, I'm sitting here on these phones 10 hours a day. I'm driving an hour every day to come here and nothing's happening. These people are rude. They're crazy. They're hanging up in my face. They're cussing me out. I did the wrong thing, right? And I don't know how many of you, I don't drink coffee anymore, but I used to be a coffee drinker, right? So my manager says to me, Dr. Ken, he says, you know what, Deborah? I went to him crying, like, I quit, I give up. You know, this was not the right decision. But in the whole time, the spirit is like, get yourself together. So I go into the office and the manager says, you know what? You see that, that, that thing around the corner of Starbucks? Why don't you walk around the corner and get you a cup of coffee? I was like, I don't drink coffee. I'm going home. He was like, no, I, I'm going to get you. So I literally learned how to drink coffee doing loans. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Good story. See, you too can learn how to drink coffee. <laughs> so I learned how to coffee drink. But the point that I'm making, it was a teaching moment because I could have given up. But I didn't. And it was my manager that saved me to say, you know what? Don't give up. Go have a cup of coffee. I went and had a cup of coffee. I came back. I started cold calling. And that very night, Dr. Ken, I got my first hot lead. I got my first hot lead that day. I could have walked away. I could have not said that God was not calling. telling me the truth. That God, I did not hear God right. I came back. I got one oh, lead. You're good. That month, I wind up getting five loans. I closed five loans in my first four months of never doing this business mm. in my life. Mm -hmm. In one month, blew me away. I became loan officer of the month. I got my own office. They was like, oh, this girl got something. <laughs> but I could have, I could have, I could have doubted God, right? Because at, Good at, work. at 26 years old, you're making 113. Who makes 113 thousand dollars at 26? I could have walked away, but I kept going and my spirit was like, just keep going and keep going. So I wound up um, doing, starting this in 2000, well late, I will never forget, it was November 1999. By March 2003, I had opened my first real estate and mortgage company on my own. Amen, I love that. Three years. Now I wanna take you a little bit deeper. I notice for your ministry, if I may ask, I know there's a lot to your life, we need like 10 videos, but um, you uh, were getting a divorce or something like that? You I went ran through a into divorce, a yes. And you actually moved in. Can you take us there? Right. So I went through a divorce in 1998 okay. with my ex-husband. 
And our divorce was horrible. We could not be on the same street together. Like he on one end, I'm on the other end, and the police gotta be in the middle. It was just a horrible divorce. My ex-husband is like 17 years older than me. So it was just, it was hard. Okay. And um, I will never forget, I didn't share this at the other segment, but the process to me moving to Dallas was because during this divorce, it had got, and I, I want people to listen to me because sometimes we feel so um, beaten in a relationship. The reason why I decided to move to Dallas because in the middle of breaking up with my husband for all these years, I tried to commit suicide. I overdosed. Mm, I overdosed. That. I overdosed because I didn't um, think that I was worthy to be a wife or a mother because my husband told me he didn't want to be with me mm. anymore because when we had our last child, he went through some things. So listen to me. This, You cannot allow other people to take you down with their own personal That's issues. That's good. Teaching apostle. So... I uh, moved to Dallas, totally distraught, totally emotional with my best friend who was also going through a divorce. Mm -hmm. Her family lived in Dallas from Dallas. We moved there with her parents. Um, we were sleeping on the floor in the living room with her parents. Her uncle, was, was her favorite uncle, had a best friend. And I wind up meeting the best friend. Five months later, wind up moving in with him in Dallas thinking that, well, he did again on a construction company but his real personality is he was a pimp. Mm. And which led you to? The Virtuous Woman Inc. Tell us what that is. So the Virtuous Woman Inc. is an organization where we um, first originally started out with what was called the Clarion Call, mm. where we literally taught other nonprofits, um, female nonprofits in the community how to engage in public policy to actually advocate for foster youth that were incarcerated. And as we began to do that, we have found out that many young girls, as young as 11, 12, and 13, were being held in juvenile halls because they were being um, tried some as an adult for either kidnapping or other crimes. Um, I learned so much because I found out if you're 11 years old and you hold another 11-year-old in the bathroom at school, they call it kidnapping. So, right, absolutely. So from there, I became um, advocating for young girls and through working with the juvenile probation and the juvenile courts, I found out that many of those girls were called girl um, children prostitutes. A child cannot be a prostitute, period, point blank, because a child does not cannot consent to have sex with an adult because they're not an adult. Good work. So we began to um, do the work and we found out that now these girls were being charged with lewd conduct with the intent of prostitution as minors. So I became a voice for them. From that was created the program Project Destiny, where Project Destiny began to work with law enforcement, um, public agencies, councilmen, supervisors, Congress, wow. Senate, um, the Sheriff's Department to liter literally recover girls that have went missing within our communities. Because a lot of times, and, and human trafficking is real nationally, internationally, but also locally. So that is how the Virtuous Woman Inc. Um, got on the map. We were actually known for recovering missing kids that nobody could find. But that was just, again, teaching moment. When you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. So I tell people all the time, Dr. Ken, I didn't find my destiny. My destiny found me. <laughs> I didn't find, because I could have found a whole lot to do. I, I didn't want to do that. But nevertheless, um, we, we were known for recovering um, missing juveniles that the parents and law enforcement couldn't find. Amen. Now, I don't mean to cut the apostle off. I hate to do this because she's going to tell us how she owns two of those facilities and how that got started. We're going to have to take a break. Just 60 seconds. So if you can stay with me just for 60 seconds, I'll bring the apostle right back. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. Of course, I've got the great Apostle Deborah with us today. I'm very pleased to announce a businesswoman, an apostolic leader, but more importantly, you said you started from that, uh, that small set or that learning process, I guess is the word, that you came back and started two houses. Is that correct? So it, it has actually been some years, Dr. Ken. It was a process, like okay. we talked about Amen. earlier. So another teaching moment 
when God, God's timing is not our timing. Good work, preach that. And we can see things that we know that God has for us, which what he sees for us is still greater than the glimpse. I always call it a sneak peek. God will give you a good sneak work. peek. That's good. But I never thought that I would be doing the work that I do at the capacity that I do it now because I started doing ride-alongs with the law enforcement, recovering missing girls. Oh, you went for it. Yeah, I, I would. I, and these were the little bitty things. Like, I never thought that it would amount out to where the county of Los Angeles literally came to me and said, hey, I was known as the crazy preacher lady on the street, the crazy preacher lady that chased the kids down the street. I with love the that. I love every minute of it. I was uh, recovering missing kids and I'll just go for it. But even in that teaching moment, I want to say to someone that everything that God does is organic. It's mm. organic. Oh, preach that. It's so organic because Every time I recovered a child, the Lord gave me the blueprint in my vision, in my dream. There are some people that I'm talking to right now that you're driving down the street and you literally go into another realm. That you can be sitting at the dinner table and you That's go it. into another realm. Exactly. And God is showing you what he needs you to do and you're trying to figure it out. Those are called sneak peeks. So you cannot allow the sneak peeks to interfere with what God is doing with you in the future. Amen. So God will begin to give me the blueprint. I would get a phone call. I get the kid's name. And even before I would um, go to the parent, the Lord would literally show me the kid's face. Oh, and then I when that. I would get into the house, I'd say, hey, that's her picture right there. Oh, my God. How do you know? It could be a family picture. I could just literally walk up. And the Holy Spirit would say, that's her top left to the corner with the braids or the blue barrette or the pink purple ribbon or whatever and this is when I began to understand that I was a seer see when God is doing things organically and your destiny chases you down so you don't have to chase your destiny I tell people all the time don't chase your purpose because your purpose is already in you the Bible says I formed you even before you were in your mother's womb oh, so you don't have to go looking for your purpose your purpose was already in you before you were a seed in the womb of your mother but your destiny you don't have to even chase your destiny allow your destiny to chase you what we do the Bible makes it clear that seek ye first the kingdom and all things shall be added unto you so as I continue to seek God and to ask out the question God who am I what are you calling me to do what do you want me to do he began to give me the blueprint to recover these kids Kids. So I became known for that. Then I became teaching moments where I was training law enforcement on how to find these kids. Because when I did the research, I realized, like, wait a minute, we're paying all these taxes for law enforcement to find kids. And they're saying we don't have the people to find the kids. Well, how can you not make a missing kid a priority? So, again, another teaching moment that when God is setting you up for destiny, he makes you uncomfortable in the things that make other people comfortable. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. He makes you uncomfortable in the things that make other people comfortable, which means that when the police told me that finding missing kids was not priority, that bothered me. Mm. So now we developed what's called Project Destiny, and Project Destiny turned into Project Destiny Home of Hope. So now we oh, have yeah. Project Destiny Home of Hope 1 and Home of Hope 2, where we have 12 girls between the ages uh, 14 to 18 that are victims of human sex trafficking. We only do specialized housing. We only deal with girls that have been um, coerced into trafficking. And I tell people all the time, or if you are in a situation where you're being held against your will, where people are having you do things with your body, even a family member, if you're being raped, molested, sexually assaulted, say something. There are so many different ways that you can Google, that you can make a phone call. And don't think that people are not going to believe you. Don't think that it is your fault. You have done nothing. These are bad people that have issues just like you. What I have known in all the years and realized and have um, did research on is many times the predator has been raped, molested, or sexually assaulted themselves. So now you have broken people breaking other people. So God, oh, yes. God has called me to break every demonic and spiritual warfare in these people, generational curses, and break the bondage of the enemy and satanic warfare. So that's what I was called to do, to snatch the captives 
out of dark places and get them to understand that you are still pure with God. You still are good with God. That no matter what happened to you, that you can still grow up and be a millionaire, be an entrepreneur, own your own hair salon, have a master's degree, have a doctorate degree. It has nothing to do with the person that hurt you. So anyone that is listening to me now, if you have ever been in any relationship, any family where you have been damaged, tore up, abandoned, or mistreated, misused, or abused, God still has your name in mind. Amen. You can really sense the anointing in the studio when she really started to preach and teach there, a powerful move. Would you do this for us? There's a lot of people that's watching us that maybe are backslidden or maybe don't know Christ himself. Could you lead them back to the Savior? Amen. So again, I'm very I'm traditional and untraditional. But what I want to say is what I always say to people. The first thing you have to do is acknowledge that you need God. And I tell people all the time, even when Jesus in the book of Matthew began to teach his disciples to pray, the first thing he said was our father. Amen. So know that God is your father. He is your daddy. He is your papa. And because of that, he protects you. He covers you and he gives you opportunity. So even if you've been mad at God, even if you think God doesn't hear you, even if you think God has forgotten about you, even if you think God has never noticed you, guess what? He has. God comes for the saved and the unsaved. God comes for the sinner and the non-sinner. Not that we all sin. We all sin. Even as a preacher, I sin. I probably sinned on the way here, you know, when I was in traffic. But nevertheless, <laughs> Amen. you can ask God right now to come back into your life and apologize. Ask, repent and ask God to forgive you of sins, known and unknown. Forgive you of things that you know that are not of God and ask him to come back into your life and remind him and thank him that he gave his son Jesus, that he died on the cross, that you should have life and you should have it more abundantly. Jesus did not die in vain. He died so that you can live, love, and laugh to the best of your ability. So I do double dare you today. Just ask God to come back in your life and remind him that you accept his son Jesus as your Lord and Savior to have the life that Jesus died for. Amen. Good work. And Apostle, I just, wow, I just sense there's such a, a fear of finances and you move so effortlessly in that realm. Uh, and also in healing, because you talked about emotional healing. Could you pray for the people, if you have a word for somebody that might encourage somebody about finances or uh, emotional healing or something like that? Take your liberty. Amen. Well, I'm good at talking about money. Um, I tell people all the time that money cometh. So Good you right. have to confess that money cometh even when you don't have money. I dare you to look back over your life in the times that you Amen. thought that you didn't have money where God carried you. Where you didn't think you were going to get a bill paid and some kind of way that bill got paid. Where you didn't know if you were going to eat in some kind of way you got a meal. Where you didn't know if you were going to be able to buy a car or pay your rent and that happened. And there may be some times that you might be facing eviction or you may be facing repossession or whatever. But you have to remind yourself that God said that you are the lender and not the borrower. You are above and not beneath. Sometimes you have to have affirmations to speak those things over your life and to decree and declare that no matter what, that God is going to always make a way for you and that he will provide for you. The Bible says in the book of Psalm, he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be, even in Isaiah 43, I will be with you wherever you go. And those are things you have to remind yourself. Money is no big deal when it comes to God because God owns everything in his heavenly place. It's already in store for you. So I want to pray for you. Father God, we come before you now thanking you, praising you, worshiping you, thanking you that you are our daddy, you are our papa, and that you open up doors that no man can shut, that you give us provision and you give us opportunity, innovative and creativity to make money for everyone under the sound of my voice where you are stuck. I decree and declare in the name of Jesus to come out of that place right now. I decree over your mind, over your hands, over your body, everywhere that you are stuck, that your body will begin to be activated now. 
that you will be rocked right now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That every demonic and satanic stronghold shall be gone off of your life. We loose it and we bind it and we curse it. We send it back to the bowels of hell where it belongs. And we say that you will be free. You will prosper. You will not be in lack and you will not be in doubt. To every double-minded person, we curse it right now in the name of Jesus and say that you have the mind of Christ to excel, to profit, and to thrive in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, the anointing has really dropped. Powerful word. One last, we want to try to get everything out of her while we got her on set. It took me forever to get her here. Apostle, if you would, I think you have a word for somebody maybe to encourage. I don't know if they're struggling with health or maybe they're just down. You maybe you could speak into somebody that's listening today. I want to just encourage everyone that is watching this show today with Dr. Ken to know, and I know that we hear this all the time, so I don't want to come to you as a prosperity prophet, even though I walk in the favor and the prosperity of God. But the word that I want to leave with you today is you are not forgotten. Amen. During this time of COVID, so many people have become so isolated. I challenge you today to remove that spirit of isolation off of you so that God will know that you still trust him in season and out of season. Even though we're dealing with the Delta now, there's a new stream. Don't allow what you hear or what you see in public or in, on TV to discourage you from who the almighty Jehovah Jireh is. God is your provider. He is your healer. He is your Jehovah Nisei. He's your Jehovah Sikhanu. He will do exactly what you believe he should do. Don't blame things on God anymore. From this day forward, be responsible for what God has called you to do, what he's asked you to do. Get up and do it. Amen. Well, I'm about out of time. I want to close with one last thought. I just sense there's people out there really struggling with money. And speaking of struggling, the kingdom does not thrive on buying and selling, as the apostle has astutely mentioned. It's sowing and reaping. So I want to give you a chance to sow into this wonderful woman of God. She's lived like 20 lifetimes in just one life, and she's still very young. But it isn't an interesting. She got saved early, but that's not the end of it. She kind of fell away, but she came back. She went through some trials, but she came back. She kept finding the key is persistency. So I'm asking you to do this. There's somebody out there that's going through some real estate deals or some building contractors, and he needs millions of dollars, and he doesn't have enough, and he's wondering, I'm here to tell you, but God. I believe that one-time seed, if you will sell 100000 that's not going to do anything to your deal. But what it will do, does she need the money? No. Here's the point. It's not about the money. It's about the seed that she can sow into uh, her ministry. Bring other women out of sex slavery, other women out of prostitution, other women into emotional healing. There's That 100000 would go such a long way. But if you would show God your hand and write that check, it's right there on the screen, the P.O. box. If you would send that and watch God would release out of his hand. It's powerful. Now, some of you say, I don't have that kind of seed. Well, what about $1,000? What about 500 What if you were faithful and say, Apostle, I'll give you 100 a month. Again, it's not about the money for her. It's about sowing the seed to the ministry she carries and stewards. And she stewards every dime with such character. What if it's 50? Can I add something, Dr. Sure. Ken? And, this, and I'm sorry, I usually don't interrupt. This is what I want to say to everyone that he's speaking to right now, the way that I was able for my destiny to chase me down, I gave when I didn't have to give. Mm. Literally, I gave when I did not have it to give. Until next time, I'm here with the great Apostle Deborah. You've been watching Marketplace and Authority. I'm Dr. Ken. We'll see you next time at Marketplace and Authority.